Okay, so this is a article by uh, Michael Crawford Urban called Low Voter Turnout Produces Bad Government. Here's why. Uh, the gist of it is that when fewer people vote, it becomes less certain that the winning party actually represents the interests of the majority of the people who are governed. Break that down for you. What they're saying, if there's 100 people who can vote and only 60% show up to vote, whoever gets selected is really only representing the voice of 60 people. So there's still 40 people who didn't participate. And the author seems to be making the argument that that leads to bad government. That maybe it even encourages bad government. Some of their points, so humans primarily look out for the, ourselves and those who we care about. Regardless of whether this is good or bad, it's natural and how most of us behave most of the time. Uh, the, this idea that we care for ourselves is you know, sometimes referred to as tribalism. You look for your in-group and those are the people you care most about. And then people who are different than you, you just don't have the energy or capacity to care about them. Okay. The result of this natural tendency is that when given a chance to govern, people usually continue behaving this way. So just because you become elected doesn't mean you all of a sudden ascend what it means to be a human being and start like caring about everyone and everything. You know, it doesn't make you a saint. Uh, dictatorships provide clear examples. A dictator's main focus is to retain power, so keep power, and enrich themselves and their families or friends, or people who can help them keep the power. They accomplish this by buying off those who support, whose support they need to retain power. A group of people, academics, called this selectorate, okay, whoever they select as people who are gonna support them. This is usually easy as dictators can funnel the resources of the country into providing the bribes required to keep the military or ruling party happy while leaving the less favored out in the cold. Democracy has its origins in efforts to reduce this inequity. Democratic leaders must appeal to a much larger selectorate to retain power than must dictators. Indeed, democratic selectorates theoretically consist of a majority of the electorate with many more people demanding benefits. Democratic leaders must use the state's limited resources much more efficiently than dictators and do so by investing in public goods, things that everyone can use like roads and hospitals. Instead of private goods, things like fancy cars that only benefit the dictator and his friends. Of course, no system is perfect. Given scarce resources, even democratic governments must make decisions that create winners and losers. I would argue that that's, it's impossible to not make decisions that do that. It's very difficult. Um, democratic political parties recognize that their decisions and promises need to produce enough winners that they will be sufficiently appealing to enough voters to win the next election. You know, and again, paying attention to what politicians actually do is important because they can make a platform, claim whatever they're going to claim, but are they actually going to come in and make whatever change they said they would? Theoretically, this produces a relatively good result policy-wise because the winning party or coalition needs to win the approval of 50% plus one of voters. And while this is not perfect, especially for the losing 50% or 49%, it is fairer than if the party with less support wins because the resulting policy should benefit at least the majority of voters. So again, this is just talking about the same issue of if you have less than half the people coming out to vote, less than half the people are being represented. Low voter turnout makes it less certain that the winning party actually represents the interests of the majority of the governed and thus, by extension, less clear that the policies being chosen actually have majority support. An example, again, I would refer back to is how Edmonton put in a law about single-use plastics and uh, single-use items and how well does that represent the needs, wants, and desires of Albertans, of Edmontonians specifically. Even more problematic is that even though voters still slightly outnumber non-voters in Canada, those, these voters are becoming less representative of the population as a whole. For example, young people vote at a much lower rate 
than old people. Regardless of why this is, it encourages parties to ignore issues important to young people while sending more on, while sending more on seniors. Okay, again, this is very logical. If you know that 10,000 people are gonna come out, and there's 10,000 voters in this age group and there's 4,000 voters in another, and the one that's smaller votes less, you're gonna focus where your votes are gonna come from. Right, people are oriented, they're aiming to win usually, and so they're gonna do what they need to to win. Additionally, consider that because we have more than two parties, many seats are won with less than 50% of the vote. Uh, I don't know who else interpreted that the author makes that sound like a bad thing that there's more than two parties, but if there's only one party, it's not government. Yeah. It's not democratic. Okay. One person on the um, ballot. <laughs> and, and keeping in mind the way our House of Commons systems works, you know, you can have people from multiple different parties, and they represent different views, and those views should be representative of what Canadians think, mm -hmm. right? So if you had ten parties in the House of Commons, you have a wide range of beliefs and views and how Canada should function, which I would say is a heck of a lot better than having just two parties. Yeah. Okay. Voters who actually need government the most, uh, example, the poor, it's not clear to me that they need government any more or less than anyone else, vote at a disproportionately lower rate, and parties, is pos parties possess increasingly sophisticated abilities to micro-target critical swing voters. Okay. Basically what they're saying is that some political parties have realized that they're in the 21st century and they use technology to figure out where to get their votes from and how to do that. These and other factors, this down. these and other factors have combined to create a dramatically shrunken selectorate. That is the group of people who support parties actually need in order to win elections. And when this happens, parties face strong incentives to focus on these swing voters by making promises to provide them with what are increasingly private goods instead of investing in more efficient and beneficial, but less individually compelling and targetable public goods. Is anyone else noticing this person just loves using words? Yeah. And not necessarily talking about anything with substance, mm -hmm. right? Um, this is not meant to sound alarmist. Last little like, let me take a step back because everything I've said is pretty cynical so far. Uh, Canada is not a dictatorship and won't become one anytime soon. Wait, I don't know when this was written, but that's, uh, I don't know if anyone has been following what the government is doing with the, like they're now asking podcasts to register with the CRTC. Or, is it the CRTC? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, our government is doing a lot to control the flow of information. And it's the media, yeah. Very, very sketchy. Uh, but our electorate is shrinking worryingly, and those who aren't in it are being increasingly ignored. In a world of scarce resources, resources that's also a negative view of the world. I think there's a lot of resources available. Um, we get much better results overall if our parties focus on providing public goods. Unfortunately, our system is increasingly incentivizing the opposite. This guy's? I don't know if this person has provided any evidence for their claims. And by further shrinking the electorate, declining voter turnout is only making things worse. He's a bad journalist. This is why you should do your democratic yeah, duty and learn about the party platform so you can cast an informed I'm vote. I'm not the only one feeling that, right? Yeah, like this is like a bit of a Debbie Downer post. Yes. Um, I'm not even sure if this is gonna help you answer your question. Um, okay, but uh, we'll, we'll move on to the assignment. 